course, I spoke quite a bit about comets in the breaking news because of uh, Comet 67P, Chur Yumov, Gerasimenko. But this time, this is a more general uh, look at comets and asteroids. And I may just uh, say something about that comet again at the end. Oops, hang on just a moment. Phil Bland of Imperial College London, writing of comets in the Times, said, the composition of minerals is all over the place, which tells us that the components that built this comet weren't formed in one place at one time by one event. Fundamentally, we still don't know how you make planets from a cloud of dust and gas. Now there's an admission. Hopefully the VILT-2 samples will help us towards an answer. That comets are primordial is the firm belief and mantra of astronomers and planetary scientists. But the mineral composition, appearance and confusion between comets and some asteroids should have ended this belief decades ago. But there's another strange thing. That's our collective irrational dread and awe of comets, which is unexplained given their benign and often underwhelming appearance. Then in 1950 came an answer that made sense particularly to those who were prepared to think for themselves, but unfortunately it collided with the cherished beliefs of experts. The answer came in 1950 with Emanuel Velikovsky's book Worlds in Collision, where he wrote in his usual dramatic style, when Mars clashed with Venus, asteroids, meteorites and gases were torn from Venus's comet-like tail and began a semi-independent existence some following the orbit of Mars, some other paths. These swarms of meteorites with their gaseous appendages were newborn comets, flying in bands and taking various shapes. They made an uncanny impression. Those which followed Mars closely looked like a troop following their leader. They also ran along different orbits, grew quickly from small to giant size and terrorised the peoples of Earth. Now, his outrageous predictions based on a cometary Venus uh, were dismissed, of course. And uh, that's because his theory was, quote, incorrect. That's a strange uh, thing to say about a theory, particularly when it's been uh, verified by predictions, successful predictions. And, of course, now we have meteorites from Mars arriving today. But those with a sense of history know you shouldn't stop someone from doing what's impossible on the say-so of an expert. Velikovsky's scenario was declared to disobey Newton's laws, but astronomers work with no real historical sense. Newton admitted he didn't understand gravity, and Velikovsky threw down his challenge to Newtonian theory clearly in the opening pages of Worlds in Collision, where he invoked electromagnetism as playing a role in the celestial mechanism. Unfortunately, it has taken more than half a century to produce an electric universe hypothesis to modify Newton's law electrically and give a plausible explanation of the more detailed events that led up to and followed a recent chaotic period in the solar system. Here we have the imaginary Oort cloud of comets. This is where these icy objects are supposed to uh, dwell the astronomer, uh, the late Tom Van Flanden, gave some valuable perspective on the hypothetical Oort cloud where the material for comets is supposed to be parked. The Oort cloud averages about 1,000 times Pluto's orbit. You'll notice that the scale on this diagram here is a log scale, so it's not linear. If the Earth's orbit was the size of a full stop, the Oort cloud would be six metres distant. And the number of short period comets is two orders of magnitude more than the, or <coughs> pardon me, the Oort cloud model would predict. The directions of approach to the Sun cluster, uh, sorry, cluster towards the direction of the Sun's motion through space, and that suggests an interstellar origin. But of course, there's no known gravitational cap capture mechanism. As I said the other day, Anything approaching the sun will accelerate to the sun and swing around it and then disappear again because there's nothing to reduce the energy, the kinetic energy of that object. So we're left with an imaginary Oort cloud of comets and a Kuiper belt beyond Neptune. The Kuiper belt is easily understood in the electric universe model once you understand the electrical birth of stars and the electrical capture mechanism of interstellar objects. 
The Oort shell, through the ceaseless repetitive workings of the gold effect, has become widely regarded as a firmly established triumph of modern cometry theory, when in fact it is a piece of trash heralded as one of the cornerstones of cometry science. So said astronomer Ray Littleton, and he was a well-known and respected astronomer in England. He also said the remarkable properties of comets are not even remotely explicable by any of the numerous ad hoc assumptions of modern comet theory. But of course, nobody listens. So we come to stardust. The grains from Comet Vil 2 were much larger than expected and made from the same high temperature minerals as found in the most abundant meteorites. This discovery was so unexpected that an early sample was thought to be contamination from the spacecraft. Like meteorites, CAIs as they're called, calcium aluminium inclusions, they're high temperature refractory minerals found in uh, meteorites. They were found in stardust. So here we have meteoritic, you know, highly modified meteoritic material in, in the um, dust of a comet. But I'll talk more about them in a moment. Is there any real difference between asteroids and comets? Comets are supposed to be primordial objects, but high temperature minerals and clay. And that's interesting because, as I mentioned in the uh, news on the first evening of Comet 67P, a geologist looking at the picture of the, near the land, a leg, said he was looking at clay. So here we have the Stardust mission where there was evidence of clay in the Stardust. Samples of Cometville 2 returned by the Stardust mission suggest it is made of rocky material like an asteroid rather than fluffy dust expected of a comet. One of the most remarkable particles found in the Stardust collection is a particle named after the Inca sun god, Inti. Inti is a collection of rock fragments that are all related in mineralogical, isotopic and, isotopic and chemical composition to rare components in meteorites called calcium aluminium inclusions, or CAIs for short. Can it be that, that asteroid and comet tails have more to do with plasma discharge and electrochemistry near the sun than with sublimating ices? A comet's low reflectivity was unexpected for icy bodies, they have instead a dark, soot-like coating on their icy surfaces, this is what we're told. Could this blackening be due to arcing rather than hydrocarbons? If so, this could invalidate the hypothesis that the hydroxyl ion detected in comet comas is due to the ultraviolet photodissociation of water molecules. Now, photodissociation of water produces positive ions. So an unexplained 100-fold abundance of negative ions close to Comet Halley's nucleus suggests, suggests cathode sputtering of surface minerals. They come off with electrons attached. And, uh, of course, the very fact that they were negative ions of oxygen means that the minerals on the surface of Comet Halley contained oxygen. As I say, the oxygen combines with solar wind protons in the coma to produce the OH and ions of water molecules. Recently, asteroid 3200 Phaeton's dust tail, which I'll discuss later, is also explained by arc sputtering, which doesn't require any explosive release of gas, because the problem is an asteroid is supposed to be a rock and yet it developed a tail going around the sun. Okay. Meteorites. And these, of course, are very important. If we're receiving meteorites from Mars, then we need to uh, look very closely at them to see what sort of uh, things have happened to those tiny rocks in the process of leaving Mars. So they're supposed to be pieces of comets or asteroids. And they're supposed to date the birth of the solar system. However, most contain millimetre-sized spheroids called chondrules the sort of little glassy drops described as drops of fiery rain. Now, chondritic meteorites also have the calcium aluminium rich inclusions uh, that show plasma oven effects, which I'll discuss further. The wealthy English gentleman, Henry Clifton Sorby, in the 1800s pioneered the use of high-powered microscopes to examine thin sections of rock. When he applied the method to a chondrite, he exclaimed that they contained droplets of a fiery rain 
The high temperature required to melt the chondrules prompted Sorby to propose that they came from the sun, ejected in solar flares. Of course, his idea is treated today as quaint nonsense, although little progress has been made since. However, it is worth noting that solar coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, do show the power of an electric discharge to hurl billions of tonnes of matter into space at colossal speed against the strongest gravitational tug in the solar system. Sorby may have been closer to the truth than anyone will credit. Chondritic meteorites are composed of three seemingly incompatible types of rock. Low temperature hydrated and carbon uh, bearing minerals around 200 degrees K. Flash melted chondrules around 2000 K. And refractory calcium aluminum inclusions. Sorry, I've used the American term. <laughs> CAIs. And there are also elemental and isotopic anomalies. Now, scientists have looked at lightning as a possible cause for these high temperature drops of fiery rain. But even on Earth, the cause of lightning remains a mystery. So that has sort of been put to one side because nobody can explain the lightning. Significantly, it seems that Comet Vilt, too, has been exposed to lightning in space. Back in 1988, I wrote a paper, it was published in the SIS journal, about chondritic meteorites. There is no conventional theory of meteorite origins that can account for the 17-odd features of chondritic meteorites identified in this paper. The electric discharge hypothesis appears to offer for the first time the possibility of an explanation for all of the peculiar features of chondrites, all 17 of them. By extension, it offers a more plausible mechanism for the creation of asteroids, comets, moons, planetary rings and companion stars than does the nebula hypothesis. That was, I wrote back in 1988. But I wasn't the first one to think about electric comets. It's clear that at least by the second half of the 19th century, many scientists believed that comet tails were fundamentally electric. For example, in August 1882, in the English Mechanic and World of Science, it wrote of comet tails, there seems to be a rapidly growing feeling amongst physicists that both the self-light of comets and the phenomena of their tails belong to the order of electrical phenomena. The dirty ice ball model of comets was discredited with the first flyby of a comet, Comet Halley. Since then, the contrary evidence has kept on piling up, as seen here. Small rocks with a coma larger than the sun. They have unexpected fine dust jets, some on the dark side. They have a nucleus blacker than copier toner. A complex cratered surface. They exhibit layering. High temperature minerals. They've been seen to emit X-rays, most unexpectedly, and they explode for no known reason. This is an artist's image. It, uh, it's rather telling because it looks nothing like the high velocity beams coming from Comet Hartley and also that we've seen coming from Comet 67P. And the explanation for this on Comet Hartley was when heat from the sun reaches a pocket of dry ice, it instantly transforms from solid to vapour, forming a jet wherever local topography happens to collimate the outrushing gas. Apparently, these carbon monoxide jets are carrying chunks of snowy water ice along for the ride. End of quote. But there's no reason to expect gas rising from beneath the comet surface, as the consensus model holds, to form a fine jet or to rise perpendicularly, as we've seen in all subsequent comet nucleus close-ups. This is Comet Vilt 2, and it shows here similar surface etching to that of an electrical discharge machine surface, which is at the bottom here. You see in particular this footprint, right? It was originally called, these were footprints. But you see how closely it matches this terraced, flat-floored depression in an electrically discharged, um, machined piece of uh, metal. You 
It is not clear why sublimation processes driven by solar illumination on a spinning body would form globally distributed circular structures. Unresolved bright spots seem to be connected with the jets from the nucleus. The mass loss seems to occur mostly from the edges of the scarps, and this is typical of electrical discharge machining. That's how it forms those terraces and so on. And the albedo of the eroded surface does not seem to change. That is, there's no buried ice. And it does seem, therefore, that the arc itself is what's causing the blackening. Any bright spots will be unresolved because cathode spots due to spark erosion can carry about a million amps per square centimetre or more. So the luminosity of a cathode spot can be a secondary effect when the spot becomes incandescent, which is unlikely on a rocky comet, or emits vapour, which we do see, or has a glowing halo of St Elmo's fire. So it may be that the images with a great contrast range are necessary to see details of this effect. And it'd have to be close up too, very close. In any case, the white spots seen are unlikely to be due to differences in surface albedo, and I expect them to be featureless, not a bright piece of rock surface. Spires on comets. Comet Ville 2 shows numerous strange pinnacles as long as 100 metres. That's a quote from the uh, report in Science. The pinnacles were unexpected. <laughs> Close-ups of other comets and asteroids show no such features. Well, we now see, have seen another one with Comet 67P. Other unusual features include long cliffs, deep pits and craters. All of these features are hypothesised to be indicative of a very rigid surface sculpted by impacts and explosive sublimation. Initially, Ville 2 was expected by many to be held together only quite loosely. Where have we heard that before? The comparison of Ville, uh, yeah, the comparison of Ville 2 spires with Monument Valley is ironic given that the entire southwest of the USA is regarded as a fine example of electric discharge machining territory by electric universe aficionados. Here we have at the bottom some of the uh, pictures from the Rosetta mission and I've uh, acknowledged Ignacio Cisneros here because uh, he's been doing a great job in looking in detail at these images and passing them on to me. There, is, there are many more pictures that I could show, but it would have taken up the whole 45 minutes. Let's get to uh, the electrical nature of comets and comet impact with Comet Shoemaker Levy 9's encounter with Jupiter. Eugene Shoemaker said, there's a chance we will see very little well, we saw a whole lot and actually overloaded some of the infrared telescopes on Earth. The dazzling display baffled astronomers. They were cosmic lightning flashes high above Jupiter's atmosphere. No water was detected, and that's important. Afterwards, we had these dark fallout rings and a black spot usually somewhere near the centre or off-centre. But some time before, Tommy Gold had suggested an electric arc was responsible for a similar ring pattern on Jupiter's moon Io. Now, um, Healy and Tony Peratt explained them in an article in Science uh, in terms of a plasma gun. Now, the, these uh, Shoemaker-Levy 9 impacts showed the same pattern on Jupiter. So the fragments of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 were destroyed by Jupiter's thunderbolt. In other words, instead of that being a, a comet burying itself into the atmosphere and then getting a rebound, throwing material back up again, which is why they expected to see water from uh, lower down in the atmosphere, Jupiter itself has unleashed a lightning bolt from its ionosphere, which has destroyed the incoming comet and the debris from it has fallen in a ring, which is typical of a plasma gun effect. There is no other explanation for these neat rings of material falling on a surface from a jet. We come to deep impact. 
This spectacular image of Comet Temple 1 was taken 67 seconds after impact. The scattered light from the event saturated the camera's detector. A split second before impact, there was a flash of light predicted by me nearly four years earlier. This spectacular image of Comet Temple 1... Oh, sorry, that's a repeater. Beg your pardon. The test of a new hypothesis is successful prediction. The more unexpected, the better. Using the electrical model of cometary activity, I predicted four years in advance on my website when announced that the deep impact mission to Comet Temple 1 would produce two flashes, a small flash before impact as the nucleus discharged to the projectile, rather like the spark sometimes as you reach for a metal doorknob. Amongst other things, I also predicted an unexpectedly energetic flash to follow the impact. I wrote, the energetic effects of the encounter should exceed that of a simple physical impact in the same way that was seen with Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 at Jupiter. So there was already a uh, precedent. And this seems to be lost on uh, cometary scientists because uh, many of these things they could have known in advance for the Comet 67P uh, adventure. After the event, NASA expert Peter Schultz suggested that the initial flash indicates a layered structure for the comet. My guess is there was soft layering on top, the impactor went down and finally got in contact with ices. Where have we heard this before? This ad hoc hypothesis of unbelievably fragile outer layers is now treated as an observational fact, a confirmation in the words of deep impact investigator Michael Ahern. Notably, however, the impact released very little water. Deep impact. The, uh, when Temple 1 was revisited by the Stardust spacecraft on February the 15th, 2011, the expected crater showed no sign of deep penetra penetration. The crater was almost indiscernible, as if the impactor had hit solid rock or partially vaporised before or on impact. Once again, the ad hoc explanations were weak. I, and I quote, stuff went up and came down. <laughs> And the crater partly healed itself, one wants to know how. <laughs> but a hard surface might have been anticipated both from the comet's appearance and much earlier evidence from radar returns from Comet Enki that implied a non-porous, probably rock surface material. How much contrary evidence do you need? The puzzling erosion of an escarpment on Comet Temple 1 is simply explained by the tendency of cathode spark machining to initiate on a sharp edge and electrically etch or sputter extremely fine material progressively back from that edge. The extreme fineness of comet dust was first remarked upon following the encounters with Comet Halley because it was not expected of interstellar dust grains. I suggest that the unexplained white spots which are observed to favour such locations are active cathode arcs and there is plenty of prior evidence for this suggestion. Here we see arc erosion on Io. Jupiter's moon Io, which it's a great laboratory to uh, look at electrical effects on a, um, a solid surface. It shows the electrical etching effect in its spectacular jets emanating from hot spots along crater walls. The flat crater floor is darkened or burned where the electrical etching is recent. Supporting a cathode discharge model are the unusual parabolic filamentary plumes and termination of the penumbra on a narrow ring, unlike any volcano. These are all diagnostic of a plasma gun effect. The breakdown field strength for lightning on Io is one-tenth that on Earth. Notably, based on his electric arc interpretation of Io's outburst, Professor Tommy Gold predicted in 1979, luminous spots in the caldera may be visible at night. As you can see on the right, his unusual prediction was confirmed. That necklace of bright spots there are cathode arcs operating along the edge of the caldera, so-called. We found layering on comets. This one is Comet Temple 1 again. Each layer is 3 to 10 metres thick and the one kilometre depression strangely sublimated away. <laughs> sublimated. The heavily pitted and cratered region uh, was discovered on Comet Temple 1 as well. The spacecraft, as it flew past, detected impacts. And they said, we were stunned. It was like flying through flak. 
just bursts in less than a tenth of a second. This gives you some idea of the narrowness of those jets, the highly high collimation of those jets, and it's not the kind of thing you'd expect from material blasting out of a fissure, which should be more widely dispersed. <laughs> but you see the description there. This is the way comets act. They send out clods of earth and ice that come apart. This was their only explanation for such short bursts. Comet Hartley 2 and its snowstorm. On November 18, 2010, Deep Impact photographed an unexpected tempest when it flew past the comet's nucleus on November the 4th at a distance of only 700 kilometres. At first, researchers only noticed the comet's hyperactive jets flamboyantly spewing carbon dioxide from dozens of sites. A closer look revealed an even greater marvel. The space around the comet's core is glistening with chunks of ice and snow, some of them possibly as large as a basketball. The very same high-resolution, high-dynamic range cameras that recorded snow chunks swirling around Hartley 2 did not detect anything similar around Temple 1. This is a genuinely new phenomenon, says science team member Jessica Sunshine. Comet Hartley 2 is not like the other comets we've visited. This may have been an unusual electrical outburst based on the tiny ice grain evidence. This is the thing, a cathode uh, jet will remove the material in very fine particles. At Comet Halley, they were surprised how fine the dust was. <clears throat> I'll just catch up to where I was. So it may have been an unusual electrical outburst from my point of view based on that tiny ice grain evidence, but it emphasises that each comet has a unique origin and history so that it may incorporate more or less water and volatiles from its parent body's atmosphere and surface material. The Electric Universe model has never denied this. The message is that the visual evidence must be treated as if on Earth. If the comet looks rough and rocky, then it's safe to say it's rock. This is some work of Tom Van Flanden, and it looks at his exploded planet model of the origin of comets. Orbital evidence points to a recent origin of comets and the asteroid belt. That was his conclusion. As Tom Van Flanden notes, uh, the asteroid orbits exhibit explosion signatures, which are a set of characteristics in the distribution of orbits that imply origin in an explosion. He argues that some fragments will have highly elliptical cometary orbits that are subject to a sun-selecting influence which matches the observed 70 to 80 percent of new comets appearing from one hemisphere of the sky centered on the ecliptic. So the many similarities between asteroids and comets may be simply explained. Clearly Van Flanden's explosion hypothesis raises the serious question, what could cause a planet to explode? However, his model applies equally well to electrical machining of planetary surfaces due to close encounters in the asteroid belt. Notably, Van Flanden predicted that asteroids would tend to have natural satellites. This was almost universally rejected, but has since been verified. I would tell you that uh, Tom's website and his uh, book, which I can't remember, it's a long title, uh, well worth reading. Uh, he was one of these people who thought for himself. So we come to asteroid origins. <clears throat> Asteroids are said to be the shattered remnants of planetesimals or perhaps the remnants of a failed planet resulted, resulting from the sweeping up of material from the solar nebula by the early formation of Jupiter. So that's the uh, standard catechism. Let's have a look. The asteroids between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter exhibit four major zones of, or families with an igneous group somewhat of 2.7 astronomical units, a metamorphic group affected by water around 3.2 astronomical units and primitive outside 3.4 astronomical units. That's how they're classified anyway. Geophysicists use this zoning and classification of asteroids in an effort to understand the formation of the solar system. Spectral signatures in meteorites are looked for to identify their origin from asteroids, and the four concentric zones within the asteroid belt yield four distinct types of chondritic meteorite. Each meteorite type has few, if any, components that are identical to those in other types, reflecting different origins. 
You may notice in this image that Vesta's surface shows similarities to Phobos and the moon with circular craters and chains of craters dotted along rills. It suggests a common mechanism has been at work on these two bodies. Asteroid 253 Matilde. Low velocity impacts of objects orbiting in the asteroid belt should produce irregular shaped craters and spalling. But asteroids don't look as if they've been splintered or broken off from larger objects. Their craters look as though cleanly machined into the surface by a giant drill without disturbing adjacent craters. Small craters tend to be perched on the rim of large craters, and large craters tend to have flat floors and central peaks. Some craters are so huge that the asteroid should not have survived. Eric Asforg, who's in the picture there, is at the forefront of scientists studying the rubble pile model of asteroids. He writes, the images of Matilde reveal some surprises and provoke an overdue re-evaluation of asteroid geophysics. Matilde has survived blow after blow with almost farcical impunity, accommodating five great craters with diameters from three quarters to five fourths the asteroid's mean radius and none leaving any hint of global devastation. Given that one of these great craters was last to form, pre-existing craters ought to bear major scars of seismic degradation, which they do not. And this is a prime example of where the electric universe is the only valid model, I think, for something like this. The distinction between uh, asteroids and comets is ambiguous. Asteroid 3200 Phaeton resembles the main belt asteroid Pallas and approaches the Sun closer than any other named asteroid. However, Phaeton showed the um, anomalous perihelion brightening and sported a stubby cometary dust tail just after perihelion in 2009 and 2012. And like a comet, Phaeton seems to be the parent of the most massive meteor shower, the Geminids, which raises questions about uh, how a rocky asteroid loses mass because they're not supposed to have the ice and so on to sublimate and blow material off. This information begs several questions. Do asteroids and comets have a common origin, their main distinction being a difference in orbital eccentricity? Do the rapid radial excursions of cometary bodies toward and away from the sun produce the surface arcing? This would explain the mass loss and dust tail of asteroid 3200 Phaeton. The Martian moon Phobos. Phobos measures 27 kilometres in the longest direction. An impact of sufficient magnitude to create the huge 10 kilometre crater Stickney should have shattered Phobos. But you notice the parallel grooves focused on the crater. The conventional theoretical ideas for the formation of the grooves are split into three main categories. Bulk fracturing of the body inducing groove formation on the surface. Superficial scars caused by falling or rolling ejecta. You can just imagine it. And surface traces of a layered intrinsic structure. Among many hypotheses, it has been suggested that the grooves could have been dug by rolling stickney ejecta, but this hypothesis was questioned using two main arguments. No block was observed at the end of the grooves, nor do they run downslope. The answer, of course, is far simpler than any of these hypotheses. There are actually crater chains, often parallel, uh, of similar size circular craters that may merge into grooves, a definite marker of electrical arcing. And the same kinds of markings have been observed on planets, moons, asteroids, and now Comet 67P. And here you will notice the parallel grooves and the common orientation of the peaks, all marked nicely by Ignacio with these arrows, and you can see the, these grooves. The grooves generally point in the direction of the electric field in that area when that area was sculpted, which may have been at the point probably when it was being formed. The discharge will have the grooves track up the peaks to the highest point in the direction of the electric field at the time. And those peaks themselves were probably um, uh, a result of the electrical separation 
with a more massive body. For those who came after Friday night, uh, I hope the um, breaking news that I did then will be available because there I go into much more detail about the recent results. But one of the things that has happened just in the last uh, day or so is that there is a hammer uh, mechanism on the lander on Comet 67P, which I believe had four different settings. One was a sort of a weak tap in case it was fluffy. And it went, uh, they were supposed to use levels one, two, and three, and four was only, only in emergencies, you know, break the glass. <laughs> They used four, and apparently it made no impression. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, comets, asteroids, meteorites, and the Martian moons, Phobos and De Deimos, all have a planetary origin, and discoveries about them support Velikovsky's story involving Mars and its menacing retinue of rubble. Thank you.